Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternatively accusing, or else defending them. What about the people who lived in the Old Testament days? Were they saved? Because God the Father is love, He has given a chance for salvation to everybody. This chance for them is the judgment of conscience. The fact is, each one who is saved by judgment of conscience has a different magnitude of goodness. Therefore, the dwelling place of heaven for each one of these people is also different according to what He has done. This is the justice and love of God. If they just kept goodness in their personal lives, they could be given only the second kingdom of heaven. But if they showed perfect goodness of sacrificing themselves for others, they could be given the third kingdom of heaven. But no one can go into New Jerusalem by the judgment of conscience. New Jerusalem will be given to those who know the gospel of Jesus Christ, have become sanctified by faith, and have been faithful in all God's house. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ and all the TV viewers, this is the 38th session of the Heaven series. In the last session, I talked about the crown of life which is given in the third kingdom of heaven. Also, we looked into the qualifications to go into the third kingdom of heaven. A person who has the faith to give all his life with his love for the Lord can enter the third kingdom of heaven. But even among those who do not know the Lord, there are some people who do such righteous acts. Some people give their lives for the king or for their parents or friends. They have truly sacrificial love. John 15 verse 13 says, A greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. But then, because salvation is given only when we accept Jesus as the Savior, does it mean that these people didn't receive salvation? God the Father has prepared a way for these people to receive salvation. It is called the judgment of conscience. Some of those who are saved through the judgment of conscience will not just receive salvation, but they will go into the third kingdom of heaven. In this session, I will talk to you about the cases where they are saved through the judgment of conscience. God the Father doesn't judge anybody unfairly. He will not unfairly judge a single person among all who have been born since creation. He judges everybody with His perfect justice and love. In this session, I hope you will come to understand more deeply the justice and love of God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Acts 4 verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has given among men by which we must be saved. This means we can be saved only by faith in Jesus Christ. He who confesses Jesus as his Savior and believes in heart can be saved. John chapter 3 verse 18 says, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Then, what about the people who lived in the Old Testament days? Were they saved? What about those who didn't know about the law? Also, in the New Testament times as well, how are the people who never heard of the gospel? Is it that all of them won't be saved because they didn't believe in Jesus Christ? It can't be like that. Because God the Father is love. 
He has given a chance for salvation to everybody. This chance for them is the judgment of conscience. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 talks about this. It says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, you know, who don't know Jesus Christ is the Savior, and who, you know, don't know the Bible, do instinctively the things of the law, then not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternatively, I mean, alternately accusing or else defending them. The law was given to the chosen people, Israel. This law became the standard for salvation. Those who were right according to the law were saved. But if they weren't, they couldn't be saved. Of course, when they violated the law, they had a way to be forgiven. But for the Gentiles, who are not Israelites, didn't have the law. However, even the Gentiles, who didn't have the law, could be acknowledged to have kept the law. It is when they do what is good according to their conscience. The conscience is a standard for each person to discern between what is good and evil. They judge whether something is good or evil according to their conscience. If the population of this earth is 6.5 billion, all the 6.5 billion people have their own conscience and judging standard. Some people consider what others consider evil as goodness and vice versa. They all have different conscience. Then how is the conscience made up? From the moment you were born, you learn from your parents, from your brothers and sisters, from your neighbors, from your teachers, or from your books. While you hear them and watch them, you make up your own conscience. In the middle of this process, something not good may be the thought to be good. The input can be made wrong. You are taught wrong as well. In addition, you make a different conscience depending on where you grew up. Some young people throw away you know, what they eat. They do throw away the food, you know, if the food is not tasty, if, you know, to their mouth. Some others eat it, even though it's not tasty. When I was a kid, most of the people were, were so poor, so we couldn't discard food. In winter days, we were always short of food. If there was something, we checked whether we could eat it or not. And if it was, then we ate it. We never thought of throwing away food. Even if some rice fell to the ground while washing, we picked them up and washed them. We collected all the leftover, and we even made you know, rice wine out of them. You know, we had, I mean, we had scruples about throwing away food. But nowadays, I mean, nowadays, since you know, this country becomes wealthy, some young people discard food when it doesn't taste good enough. But still, those who are in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, or 80s, they don't do so. They don't throw away. Depending on under what kind of environment people grow up, people come to have different conscience. People judge by different standard. So this conscience is different from person to person. That's because the heart with which each one is born is different and each one's living environment is different. According to what they see and hear from, you know, to form what is called their self, the standard of judgment of the conscience becomes different. 
If everybody is taught from birth by the Lord, each one's conscience would consist of the truth, and each conscience would have to be similar from person to person. But for the most part, it's not so. That's because they are brought receiving instruction from people who don't know the truth well and whose own actions are unrighteous in the sight of God. Therefore, in the sight of man, one's conscience may be good and proper, but in the sight of God, it's difficult to find a very clean conscience. Even though one's conscience is very clean, it cannot reach the standard of God. Even though everyone's conscience may not be perfect, it still contains good and evil. Each one has his own standard of judgment, and the individual standard of judgment acts just like the law. They think something to be good and they follow it. When they think something is evil, they don't follow it. When they don't follow something to be good, then they feel trouble in their conscience. That's why today's scripture, verse 14 says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, this, not having the law, are the law to themselves. Therefore, for those who lived when there was no law, if they followed the good, not the evil, according to their conscience, it was the same as following the law itself. If they did what was evil according to their conscience, or if they didn't do what was good according to their conscience, it was the same as violating the law. Their conscience testified to themselves. It was the same with those who never heard the gospel even after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Those who are good at heart believe in the existence of God just by seeing things which are created in an orderly manner. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature has been, you know, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So can you see His invisible attributes and His eternal power and divine nature? No, you cannot see them. But those who have good conscience will clearly see His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature. Also, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says that God has also set eternity in man's heart. Those who are good in heart instinctively seek God and though vaguely they believe the life after death they also revere the heavenly beings they try to live a righteous and good life and they follow the will of God the truth to some extent if they heard you know if they had heard the gospel wouldn't they have definitely accepted the Lord and be saved and enter into heaven kingdom so God lets them receive salvation. After their lives are over on this earth, they first go to the upper grave. They don't go to lower grave and suffer. All the pains that they suffer in hell, they suffer in the lower grave. As they stay in upper grave, they hear about the way of salvation and they accept Jesus Christ. So, before the Lord was crucified, Abraham was the head of the upper grave, and he was in charge of the upper grave. And other forefathers of faith taught them that Jesus is the Savior. Then, after the Lord resurrected, he took all the saved souls in the upper grave. And still, the men of God teach those souls who come to the upper grave by the conscience judgment, by the judgment of conscience. They are taught that Jesus Christ is the Savior. So, whoever comes to the, uh, uh, the, the upper grave by the judgment of conscience, they are taught that Jesus Christ is the Savior. That's why Jesus went to the upper grave after he was crucified. The first Peter chapter 3 verse 19 says, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Since the body is in the earth, just the spirit goes up. That's why it says, also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. 
in the Old Testament times, those who were saved through the law and those who were saved by the judgment of conscience could all accept Jesus Christ as their Savior in the upper grave. After that, they went to the waiting place of heaven, which is in the outskirts of paradise. Likewise, those who are saved by the judgment of conscience in the New Testament times hear the gospel and accept Jesus Christ while they stay in the upper grave for three days. After that, they go to the waiting place of heaven as well. Because Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, those who are saved by judgment of conscience have to go through this kind of process. But some people don't teach this correctly because they don't know it. There was a professor who was quite you know, famous when I was in theological seminary. When I was a freshman, he said, you know, those who don't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior cannot be saved because Jesus is the only way. He added that all the people of the Old Testament times went to hell. He said, before the gospel was preached, those who didn't accept the Lord as Savior all went to hell. But the Holy Spirit in my heart kept saying, that's not right, that's not right. There were many people of God in the Old Testament days, right? Did they all go to hell? How surprising. He or some others just believe that without the blood of Jesus Christ, people have never been saved. They just believe it in the Bible solely. They don't know about the conscience judgment, the judgment of conscience. That's why they make such mistake. On the other hand, those who are not saved by the judgment of conscience will fall down to the lower grave, which is called Hades. They will suffer in the Hades until the great judgment, and then they will be thrown into eternal fire of hell. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, now, which dwelling place in heaven will be given to those who are saved by the judgment of conscience? Aren't you curious? Because they didn't do anything for the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, will they all go to paradise? The fact is that each one who is saved by judgment of conscience has a different magnitude of goodness. The level of how righteously each one lived is also different. Therefore, the dwelling place of heaven for each one of these people is also different according to what he has done. This is the justice and love of God. Without this, how many people who went to hell would have complained against God? They would have said, What did God made us born and go to hell? What did God the Creator created us and made us go to hell? They didn't know Jesus because there was no Jesus. They didn't know the Gospel. How much would they have complained? If they all had entered paradise, they could have complained, saying, We were not cultivated well enough, and we are just here in paradise. We, who were born after Jesus Christ, can go to paradise, or first, second, and third kingdom of heaven. But if those who were born before Jesus Christ all had went to paradise, just paradise, you know, you know just paradise, wouldn't they have complained? Wouldn't they have felt it, you know, it's not, it's not fair? then what are the standards to decide the dwelling place of those who are saved by the judgment of conscience? Let me first tell you about those who go into the uh, third kingdom of heaven. For those who know the gospel, to go into the third kingdom of heaven, they must love God to the utmost degree. The evidence of loving God to the utmost degree is to cast off all kinds of flesh and become sanctified. What does the Bible say? What is the proof of loving God? It is to keep the commandments of God to prove that we love God, right? Also, it is to be able to sacrifice one's life for the Lord. And among those who didn't hear the gospel, there are some people who sacrifice their lives to keep their conscience, righteousness, and goodness. For example, there are faithful ministers of nations who sacrifice their lives for the country and the king. 
even though the king didn't recognize their faithfulness and suffered unreasonably, they didn't hate the king or complain against the king. Loyal subjects and faithful retainers were wrongfully accused. They were severely beaten, they were banished, and they were beheaded. But they didn't complain against their kings. Even if they were bestowed poison, they turned to the place where their kings stayed, took a bow, cleaned their body, and received the poison. Even if they were accused wrongfully, they rather showed their love and respect for their kings and accepted the death. Following the righteousness in their conscience, they were faithful until their death. This righteousness of conscience of those ministers is consistent with the righteousness in the truth. This belongs to the third or the fourth level of goodness in the truth. They had the goodness and righteousness that was in line with the truth, and they gave themselves up to keep that goodness and righteousness. If they had heard the gospel, what would they have done? They most certainly would have loved God unchangeably, and they would have sacrificed their lives for God too. Therefore, God acknowledges the fact that they can go into the third kingdom of heaven. For example, let's think about Admiral Sun Shin Lee in Korea. Admiral Lee didn't know Jesus Christ, but acted in a way that was in agreement with the truth. For the country, for the king, and for the people, he worked faithfully, sacrificing his life. He didn't want to take any personal fame, authority, or wealth. He only sacrificed and served everybody. We cannot find any trace of evil in his life. Even when he was wrongfully accused, he was arrested but was just like a gentle sheep. He didn't complain against anybody. When he was wrongfully accused by someone, he kept silent. He was tortured severely, and he was forced to serve the country with no rank. But he accepted. He didn't complain. He didn't complain against the one who wrongfully accused him. He was greatly injured and damaged because of the severe torture. But even though his people around him asked him to take some rest, he didn't care for his body. He rather said, how can I take some rest as a sinner to my country? He thought of the country first. Then, he thought of the king, and then the people of this country. And then he thought about his own family. Even though his family could be captive by Japanese soldiers, he cared for the country I had. He cared for the country first. When people around him told him to have a plan for his family, he cared for the country first. He, ho he didn't hold any grudges against the king who exiled him, but he showed the utmost thanks to him. He went out to the battle for that king and the country, and he fought with all his life. Also, from time to time, he prayed towards heaven. It means he recognized the existence of God. 
Wouldn't God of justice and love take him into a good dwelling place in heaven? If such a good man were to go to hell, is it fair? Admiral Lee didn't seek any kind of fame or honor. When he had the uh, last battle against the Japanese, it was the last battle for him, he didn't put on any armor or breastplate. Even though, you know, uh, bullets and arrows were flying, he didn't wear them. He was a mirror. He has to wear. Later, people say, Admiral Lee already decided to die in that battle. Why was that? If he won the battle and defeated the enemy, he knew he would be accused again. And he knew the people who helped him would also be accused. So he chose to die in honor. That's why he didn't put on any armor. And this is what people say later. I'm not sure whether this theory is not, this theory is right or not. Only God knows. But people guess it. Even though he was greatly loved, respected, and honored, he knew what would happen to him. Since he knew his people who would help him would be accused wrongfully, he chose death. Since he was such a good man, how could he not go to heaven? Some good people are found in history. I was deeply moved when I read the Romans of the Three Kingdoms. There are many good people who were faithful to their countries. I respected them a lot. And I wanted to become like them when I was a kid. As you may know, the famous Zhou Galiang was a really good man. No trace of evilness was found in him. Other generals had many evil, but he didn't. What about General Zhou Jiu Liang? He didn't have he didn't have any evil in him. He was loyal to his king, people, and country. He was one of the uh, five great generals, but he didn't have any evil in him. He died of an old age. He didn't die in the battlefield. He was in every battlefield, but he survived all the battles. But he died in peace on his bed. He didn't even get sick. He died of his old age. Zhu Galiang prophesied he would die of disease because he killed so many people. Pride. He recognized the existence of God as well. If these good people cannot go to heaven, do you think it's fair? There are other cases where God takes people who are saved through judgment of conscience into the third kingdom of heaven. It is those who have precious hearts and sacrifice themselves completely for their parents and neighbors. Well, I didn't mention parents who sacrifice themselves for their children. Why? That's because it's natural. But it's not easy for a child to sacrifice or give up one's life for parents. Well, it happened in the old days, but it's hard to find these days. But parents must be able to give up their lives for their children. If a child goes to prison, and if his parent can go to the prison on behalf of his child, 
the parent must be able to do so. This is the love of parents. Parents should never forsake their children. When does a child ask them to give a birth to him or her? He didn't ask them. Parents loved each other and gave birth to him or her. If the parents discard and forsake him or her, does it make sense? For example, let's consider the case of Shim Chung and Kong Ji, who are main characters in Korea's, in Korea's traditional story. Shim Chung served her blind father with all her life, with thanks to him for raising her in a difficult situation. Finally, she sacrificed her life to allow her father to receive his sight. Also, in case of Kong Ji, with all her heart, she served her stepmother, who was giving her such a hard time. She never hated her stepmother. She never grumbled, even in a difficult situation. With all her love, she took care of Pachi, her stepmother's daughter. Her stepsister persecuted Kongji the way her mother did. But Kongji took them all, and she kept silent. Even when her stepmother favored her own daughter Patri to an extreme extent, she only understood her with goodness, not having any grudges. Now, even in the truth, what level of goodness is the goodness of Kongji and Shim Chung? Of course, it's just a mere story. If it were a true story, how good they were. Is it the third or fourth level of goodness? If there had actually been people like this, they would have surely entered the third kingdom of heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, then what kind of people will enter the second kingdom of heaven or the first kingdom of heaven by the judgment of conscience? First, those who live the personally good life will enter the second kingdom of heaven. They didn't really do anything good for others, but they didn't do anything evil either. They lived faithful lives. They followed goodness at their personal level without causing any harm to others. But those who go into the third kingdom of heaven didn't just live a good life at personal level. Following the goodness of their conscience, they sacrificed themselves for the country and their neighbors. They had love so that they could give up their life if they had to. They showed the righteous acts of sacrificing themselves for the benefit of other people. This kind of a person can affect others to follow goodness, being touched by the acts of goodness. Goodness has different depths. If they just kept goodness in their personal lives, they could be given only the second kingdom of heaven. But if they showed perfect goodness of sacrificing themselves for others, they could be given the third kingdom of heaven. It is the same with those ministers who kept their faithfulness to the country and the king. We can see that the righteousness in each minister's heart was different. Suppose something unrighteous happened. A righteous minister who can go to the third kingdom of heaven will be able to change the unrighteous things to be right. And all the processes will be done in goodness. Even though he may have to suffer disadvantages, such a person endures with goodness. Even though some others accuse or slander him, he will not pay back evil with evil. But how would a minister who can go into the second kingdom of heaven act? He will not only endure the unrighteousness, but he can endure everything with goodness. But he doesn't show any active moment to correct what is unrighteous. When there is a chance of losing his life, he steps back. But the one with the goodness that is good enough to enter the third kingdom of heaven will take the way of righteousness even if he may lose his life. 
Next, a minister who can go into the first kingdom will not be able to endure when he sees something unrighteous. He may burst out his anger and his heart will be discomforted. Also, he may show some kind of you know, counteraction within his own righteousness and face damages. This kind of person will be given the first kingdom of heaven. When his life is threatened, he steps back, even though he seems righteous. God can measure each individual's goodness and righteousness precisely, even though they didn't hear the gospel. God takes each one to eternal dwelling place in heaven according to perfect justice and love. Since God knows everything in advance, whenever I realize what God has prepared and done for me, I and the people around me are astonished many times. Let's say I need $1 million. Then it will be ready soon. Then when did God start to prepare for it? Five or ten years ago. He already started to prepare for it. God knew that I would need it that amount in the five or ten years ago. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in this session, I talked to you about what the judgment of conscience is. Also, I talked to you about the standards of the judgment and which dwelling places will be given to those who are saved by the judgment of conscience. We learned there are people who will go into the third kingdom of heaven. But no one can go into the New Jerusalem by the judgment of conscience. Of course, it doesn't mean they cannot even visit New Jerusalem. It means New Jerusalem will not be given as the eternal dwelling place for those who are saved by conscience. New Jerusalem will be given to those who know the gospel of Jesus Christ, be, have become sanctified by faith, and have been faithful in all God's house. Therefore, we have to realize how blessed we are to have heard the gospel. Even though they lived their life in such goodness, since they didn't hear the gospel, they cannot go higher than the third kingdom of heaven. Well, they are, of course, thankful for being saved and going to the third kingdom of heaven. Now, the people in this are more thankful because they have a better chance to enter New Jerusalem? I don't think so. Why? That's because they live in a world where sins are so rampant. It's not easy to cast off evil, to sanctify themselves. You are living in the world where it's not easy to cast off evil and sanctify yourself without being stained in sin. Well, that's why it's more worth it. If you cast off every form of evil to the point of shedding blood and get sanctified, it's well done and it's very worth it. Your faith can be recognized better. It's easy to live in goodness with those who are good. But it's not easy to live in goodness with those who are evil. If your friends call others bad names, speak ill of others all the time, if they envy others and judge and condemn others all the time, it's not easy to stay away from them, not to get stained by them. But there are those you know, who don't get stained by them. They don't compromise with the world. These people are, the, you, know, these people are you guys. And you are leading such a believing life here. Since you don't compromise with the world, try hard to cast the evil to the point of shedding blood and come to spirit and whole spirit being sanctified. How can God not love this church? Since God loved this church so much, He shows various kinds of miracles and signs and wonders. Last week, for whole seven days, there were rainbows every day. Okay, watch the screen. Can you see the double fold? The rainbows are everywhere. Circular rainbows, symmetrical rainbows, and double fold rainbows, and so on. How beautiful are they? Last week, such rainbows were showed up every day. 
wherever mummy members stayed, such rainbows were there. All the mummy members around the world can see such rainbows and clouds, right? God loves this church so much, that's why. Since you try so hard to resist against sin and to get rid of sin even to the point of shedding blood, God cannot but love this church. Dear brothers and sisters, sometimes there are some people who used to be our church members, but they were deceived or they were persecuted by their family and they left this church. And they manage believing life in other churches. Don't you have such a family member? Now, you must discern it by the truth. The Bible clearly tells us the disciples of the Lord preached the gospel, and the signs and wonders proved that the Lord was with them. They proved that the gospel they preached was true. Signs and miracles are the proofs of God's being with them. The Bible clearly says that the Lord was with them and it was proved by the signs and miracles that accompanied with them. And they proved that the, the, their gospel was true. Believers must be accompanied by such signs. Believers can show divine healing, drive away demons and serpents, and they don't get hurt even if they drink poison. Then, does it mean that it is unfair for those who do not go into New Jerusalem only because they never heard the gospel? It's not so. It is such a great grace in itself that they are saved even without having heard the gospel. Also, God gives them better dwelling places in heaven according to each one's goodness and righteousness of the heart, so they are given great love. The more of goodness, the better place they would have entered. Our Father God is as faithful as this. He judges each and every one with His perfect justice and love, even those who didn't have a chance to hear the gospel. Now, what would you do who have heard the gospel? You know the bright way to heavenly kingdom. Especially, you clearly know the way to New Jerusalem after hearing this sanctification gospel, the gospel of sanctification. Therefore, I hope that all of you will believe the faithful God, follow the way of holiness, and go directly into New Jerusalem. Even though other people may not know, our Father God knows very well the goodness and righteousness in your heart. May you win the victory by faith every day, so that you will be able to dwell before the throne of Father in New Jerusalem. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. I will pray for all those who are sick. Place your hand on sick parts and infirmities of your body and receive this prayer. If you are not ill, place your hand on your chest and receive this prayer for the desires of your heart. The work of the Almighty God transcends time and space. He will also work according to your faith. No matter where you are, when you receive this prayer in faith, you will surely experience the astonishing power of God. Hallelujah! The Almighty God of love, please lay your hand on all your children and on all GCN viewers who receive this prayer on television. Lay your hand and manifest your work that transcends time and space on every viewer who receives this prayer in faith in every corner of the world. Give each of them the faith by which they can believe and drive out all the power of negative thoughts and doubts. Drive out all trials and sufferings. Scorched by the fire of the Holy Spirit and cleansed with the blood of our Lord from head to toe, the five viscera and the six entrails, each joint and all nerves, tissues and cells manifest the power most high of the creation. I command in the name of Jesus Christ, the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, bacteria and weaknesses go away. All contagious diseases go away. All terminal diseases, endemic diseases and newly discovered diseases be scorched by the fire of the Holy Spirit, be cleansed, be strengthened. 
Let there be healing of gastric cancer, lung cancer, uterine cancer, intestinal cancer, and skin cancer. AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, heart diseases, lung diseases, all kinds of women's diseases, hypertension, hypotension, diabetes, skin diseases, and inflammation. May polio, paralysis, arthritis, and herniated disc be healed and made perfect. May the pain from lumbago, headache, and neuralgia disappear. May all after effects from a variety of accidents be cleansed and made perfect. May cold, flu, fatigue from sickness, and thyroid diseases be scorched by the fire of the Holy Spirit and be cleansed. Epilepsy, autism, depression, nerves break down, and all kinds of mental diseases go away. May all darkness be driven away and let there be joy and peace in their hearts. Father God, by the power most high of the creation, may all that is weak be made perfect and whole again. May all that is paralyzed become loosened, and may the crippled walk and jump. May the dimmed eyesight be brightened. May those with troubled hearing hear well. May the blind receive sight. May the deaf come to hear. May the mute begin to speak. Father, Bless those who are unable to conceive, rejoin broken bones, and make all burnt parts of the body perfect and whole. Cleanse by the fire of the Holy Spirit those who suffer from addiction of narcotics, drugs, toxicants, and poison. May the dead and dead nerves and cells revive. May all darkness be forced away, and may all evil spirits be driven out. I command in the name of Jesus Christ, the enemy devil and Satan, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, go away. May all their messengers be also driven out. May all the power of darkness, evil spirits, wicked spirits, dishonest and crafty spirits, estranging spirits, deceiving spirits, be driven out. May all chains of injustice be loosened. Darkness, go away. May the light come. Father God, strengthen their spirits as well as their flesh. Give them strength to call out to you, give them strength to throw away their sins and become sanctified. As each of their soul gets along well, may all in life go well with them. Answer the desires of their hearts and prayers. Give them faith, hope, and love, and may their families also come to hear and believe in the good news. Protect them from accidents and disasters, and bless them to lead prosperous lives without hindrance. Protect all God's children at home, work, and business with the fiery wall of the Holy Spirit and the eyes of the Lord that are like blazing fire. Bless them whether they come in or go out, and bless them to lend to many people but borrow from no one. Give them wisdom and understanding and allow them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Give all ministers and workers of the Lord the ability to carry out the tasks you have given them well. May there also be great revival at each church. Lead your children so that they may give glory to you whether they eat or drink or whatever they may do in life. Manifest your work so that their lips may testify, I have met him, I have experienced God, I have received his answers, and I have received God's blessing. Father God, thank you. May you alone receive all the glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.